to continue with our speaker for today. We are extremely happy to have Professor Nirmala Manon here with us today. She's an Associate Professor of English at the Indian Institute of Technology in Indore, where she also leads the Digital Humanities and Publishing Research Group. Her main research focus is on post-colonial literature and theater, especially the comparative study of 20th century post-colonial literatures in English, Hindi, and other languages. She has published two books on the subject, Migrant Identities of Creole Cosmopolitans, Transcultural Narratives of Contemporary Postcoloniality in 2014, and Remapping the Postcolonial Canon, Remap, Reimagine, Retranslate in 2017. She's currently working on a book titled Decolonizing Knowledge Structure, Digital Humanities in India, and her talk today is on a similar subject. Decolonizing Knowledge Infrastructures, Open Access and Multilingual Scholarly Publishing. Please, Dr. Manon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Agnieszka, for a nice introduction. And thank you to SESTA for inviting me uh, for this talk. I am both uh, excited and nervous because I'm kind of, you know, I've been trying to think about how to have this uh, discussion. So thanks to all of you and thank you, Nick. I'll share my screen right now. Can you all see it? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I had sent my title uh, to, to Agnieszka as, you know, decolonizing knowledge infrastructures in, um, you know, uh, digital knowledge infrastructures in India. Uh, but the thing is, like, you know, when you talk about digital humanities in India, there is, uh, there is so much to cover. And there is so much to cover as to how you get to a particular point. Uh, so I thought that, you know, I would start off by saying that, you know, yes, you know, decolonize, but how, how do we do that? Uh, one of the ways in which we have tried to think about it is, you know, to talk about the regional turn in digital humanities in India. And by the regional turn, I mean regional in terms of small DH, you know, DH projects in small, uh, small projects small, uh, you know, in uh, languages other than English, uh, and the kind of challenges that we face when you try to put those ideas into action. So what I'm trying, I'm, what I'm going to try and do is, um, uh, is to start off by saying that the way when you talk about digital humanities in India, it is, you know, I kind of think about it in three ways, that it is, has to be multilingual, it is chaotic and it is cacophonic. And I feel that in some ways that perhaps my talk today would also be somewhere you know, in, those three, uh, in those three terrains. And I'll try to make it as clarifying as I can as we go along. So, what the, so let me just kind of tell you how I plan to do this talk. I would like to begin by talking about some of the projects uh, that we have uh, in India or from India or about India and uh, local projects. Uh, talk about the pedagogical attempts across the country in various institutions um, and how kind of both of them together in some ways for me forms the basis of how we think about infrastructure you know, or digital infrastructure or research infrastructure. And how, you know, where, and that I believe is where we face the most challenges and how do we, um, how do we negotiate those challenges? You know, we do know about like, you know, what my friend Alex Gill calls minimal computing. Uh, we know about, you know, what in the Indian parlance is called Jugaad, which is kind of making do with what we have. And you do see some resourceful uses um, of technology. Uh, but on a larger scale, you know, in a larger scale, like meta, in a meta way, 
where is the infrastructure how do we kind of uh, create or build it and how do we start how do we kind of think about it right? uh, as agneska just said you know that my my training is as a traditional post colonial scholar and my first two books were really you know very much in a um, uh, in the literary uh, literary sp space of post colonial studies right? what took me to digital humanities was the, some of the very questions that i was asking in those books and to think about whether those questions can be answered uh, or at least attempted uh, through you know a translation of those ideas into projects so in, for me you know my entry as well as my imagination about digital humanities is kind of always has been an intersection uh, has been an interaction between theory and praxis so it's something that i continue to do that with my students in our lab here at iit indore where i have a wonderful group of students i hope some of them are here today uh, you know, but i don't know it's late uh, so that's how i think i'll try and take you through this and i'm uh, you know wherever i'm not able to elaborate too much i'll be happy to take questions uh, now i am also kind of you know drawing on a recent uh, chapter that we wrote for the debates and uh, debates in dh series uh, where uh and i'll try to read a little bit and you know also extemporize uh, while digital humanities has been institutionalized for a better part of a decade in anglo american settings as as brennan has pointed out it has been an elusive presence within post colonial sites uh with respect to india when 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 i think about digital humanities in india i look at two projects to illustrate the kind of space and the difference uh, of how these projects have come about so the one is that you see in the middle in that uh, rectangular space is uh, uh, bichitra which is an annotated uh, archive of tagore's works uh, and the second one is uh, project madurai a digitized uh, collection of ancient tamil classics it is one of the earliest examples of what we now call digital humanities it was developed as early as 1998 and released its e text in tamil script code for information exchange or tscil and migrated in 2004 to unicode tamil uh, you know the other one as i said is a verorium of tagore's works and it is created and maintained by the school of cultural texts and records at jadavpur university the two projects originated in significantly different ways project madurai was uh, independently developed by a group of scholars conceptualized built and disseminated as a scholarly labor in the peripheries of educational institutions bichitra on the other hand was developed and hosted by a robust network of academics and scholars at jadavpur university school of cultural texts and records in the present context you know currently you have similarly you have the national digital library which is a huge project led by uh, by iit kharagpur or indian institute of technology kharagpur whereas a small community in rajasthan is indexing and digitizing and thus preserving seraiki a small language that traveled during the partition across the border and was almost forgotten and is now getting a, a new lease so you know the reason we uh, in the article that we argue and the reason we start with these two example is to underline that the history of recognizable digital humanities projects even if they do not self identify as dh and i'll tell you in a moment why because uh, there is still not uh, an acceptance of the moniker of dh you know for many of these projects so while we identify them as uh, dh projects uh often times the project directors as well as the people who run those projects are not particularly um, and not particularly interested in either ident you know labeling themselves or being you know labeled as dh projects you know so for example the swatantra malayalam project that you see down there which is a amazing wonderful nlp project uh, and i you know uh, invite all of you to take a look at it has various projects on indic scripts um and you know using nlp techniques and uh, predictive uh, you know predictive text uh, and you know it it has been so difficult to get in touch with the person who runs that uh, 
uh, because he he's just doing what he wants to do and is not particularly interested in having an academic conversation about the wise. So that's a whole different story. But um, uh, so they have what it shows us is that you know, all of these have varied institutional, cultural, and independent trajectories. Apart from these, you know, you have the Indian Memory Project, the Kerala State Central Library, rare books online, uh, examples of preservation of history and memory. Uh, beyond us, uh, the South Asian borders, um, I'll just get, take you a quick, uh, like the Shod Ganga, which is a reservoir of Indian thesis, which is also a big uh, uh, government of India project, and it is an open access project. Um, the Ulu Digital Archives is uh, again another project of a canonical writer. Uh, there's a Tamil agrarian project. And for those of you who are interested, there's an amazing project called the People's Archive of Rural India. So these are all kind of very different projects with different trajectories, different originary stories. And those stories are actually very uh, interesting and tells us why um, it is difficult to encapsulate or to kind of, you know, um, uh, comprehensively tell you like how, what is the, uh, what are the contours of um, DH projects in India. Uh, and so, you know, uh, as I kind of stumble through them, I'm kind of trying to, exp uh, trying to convey that kind of stumbling, uh, you know, uh, uh, stumbling journey. So beyond the South Asian borders ventures that address South Asian issues, uh, and sometimes, you know, situated in Anglo-American frameworks are the 1947 Partition Archive, uh, which is now actually maintained by the Stanford University Digital Repository, and the South Asian American Digital uh, Archive, or SADA, uh, emerging out of a charitable organization based in Philadelphia. Uh, it's developed by the Center for Studies in Social Sciences in Kolkata at Heidelberg University, uh, Germany and a recently launched mobile application, Safarnama, that traces the locations of partition in Delhi, led by my friend, Professor Deborah Sutton of Lancaster University, are examples of Indian DAs partnered with international universities and oftentimes hosted and located in those universities because of their better, better digital infrastructure and access. So that, that is the point that I keep coming back to and that, you know, kind of tells me that this is where we need to think about DH uh, in India in terms of building infrastructures. Among institutions, uh, we see related projects and research in public universities as Jadavpur University, the University of Pune, you know, many of the IITs, many of the IIMs, some private universities like Flame University, Ashoka University, uh, so, the, you know, these are all projects, like I said, some of them are institutional and some of them were developed and, uh, in the peripheries of uh, universities with independent scholars, with international collaborations. So these are projects. So if we think about projects and then pedagogy, right? so uh, maybe, you know, in some ways it should be the other way around, but often now the pedagogy has followed the projects. So you have had, as I said, you know, projects as early as 1998, where people recognized, you know, the need to harness digital tools uh, for humanities research. Right? But recently, and I would say as recently as, you know, maybe only a decade or so, universities have begun to recognize the need for training future scholars, for training students and scholars in digital tools, you know, uh, in uh, digital humanities as a discipline, and slowly but surely you're seeing uh, uh, the field uh, uh, become um, understood and uh, adopted in different ways across, the, you know, across the uh, uh, um, uh, across the country, universities, both public and private. Right. So um, this was like, you know, in a um, uh, uh, an essay on digital humanities pedagogy in India. Uh, it was a collection of essays where uh, I have, we have a chapter, my student and me, where we look at digital pedagogy across Indian universities. So here's what we found. Like I said, the elite universities like the IITs, the IIMs, some of the R1 research universities have programs. They have MSc programs, they have PhD programs, they have research groups, you know, that are doing digital humanities. 
computational humanities, computational linguistics. So they're really well developed uh, you know, research groups. Uh, but uh, that is not the case in the larger university system. Now, the part of the reason for that is, uh, uh, is that public universities in India, uh, unlike the R1 universities, have to go through a much longer, and I might say, torturous process of getting uh, approvals for new courses or new programs. Uh, because we are all, you know, the public universities are governed by what is called the UGC or the University Grants Commission. And so uh, oftentimes universities cannot simply start programs or courses without approvals. And therefore, you know, it takes much longer. So what we found, you know, in a, in a study of more than 50 public university programs and their curriculum, um, it showed that established mainstream courses usually apply the large, uh, uh, you know, uh, occupying large spaces such as English economics, uh, psychology, political philosophy, uh, and other interdisciplinary courses, history, economics, political science, political science, history, local self-government, social work, economics, political science. All of these, you know, we see that these courses are aligned with computer applications. So you have, you know, for example, a history course that includes a module on computer applications. You have, you know, a, a, a political science course that has like a computer applications module. So our understanding, and this is something that we did about four years ago, our understand, and I know for a fact because I have been on many of those boards, uh, academic councils, you know, that have later gone on to start courses in digital humanities, that, you know, that was their first foray uh, because that was doable. That was doable uh, within, you know, within the university system without waiting for long approvals. And, and over a period of time, over a period of one or two years, you know, they kind of developed into uh, fully formed, uh, fully formed DH certificates or, you know, DH minors. Uh, uh, or simply electives, you know, for students from across uh, across uh, departments. Uh, so while digital humanities um, uh, as a subject program or course were few in number, the use of technology in uh, various courses and other humanities departments were quite prolific. There was also both interest and engagement with digital tools among students with whom we spoke. In short, institutionalization of digital humanities as a formal curricular term was not as present then. It's more present now and more visible now. Uh, uh, but institutional projects at the intersection of computation and humanities were very much, you know, uh, uh, very much flourishing. So to categorize the translucent representation of works and projects, and I, we call it translucent because, you know, as I said in the beginning, we invoke them under the rubric of DH, but they seldom self-identify as such. You know? So we kind of, you know, it, uh, it, mm, it makes us realize as recently as, you know, we had this uh, second DH conference uh, that uh, uh, in India that just concluded a week ago. And even by this point, I still, uh, you know, there's a lack of consensus over using a disciplinary appellation of, uh, of uh, uh, digital humanities. So the reason I underline that and I kind of emphasize that is because, you know, uh, we, I, uh, in, in, uh, in our essay as well as, you know, we kind of contest this assumption uh, that we have seen in some articles that DH is quote unquote, still relatively new within South Asian studies, unquote, in terms of its pedagogical uh, potential practices or even its superficial optics. Uh, we argue that, you know, that the presumption comes from the invisibility of uh, digital humanities work in English and related departments. So remember Kishenbaum's uh, article about, you know, uh, what is digital humanities and what is it doing in English departments? What we found is that, you know, uh, uh, English departments are not necessarily the originary uh, uh, spaces for uh, digital humanities in India, and you cannot really draw a linear trajectory from these departments to digital, uh, you know, to DH. In fact, what we find is in some ways uh, that it is uh, institutions such as the IITs or like, you know, Presidency University or, you know, Delhi University, some of the big universities that have actually you know, gone ahead and developed courses at the intersection of technology and 
uh, and the humanities, specifically within an IIT system that I am a part of, I found it far easier to convince um, colleagues in, in the STEM fields about you know the need for a lab, for example, you know because these are infrastructural uses, uh, you know needs, uh, or the need for you know some tools for to do my research, and it it actually was far more easy to persuade uh, them than my colleague in a university system who had to persuade her you know uh, her traditional English department or history department that she wants to do a spatial humanities project or a GIS project. And you know the and the challenges of finding resources for doing that. Right? So uh, so we you know I, in that uh, essay and and I argue that the presumption comes from the invisibility of digital humanities work in English and related departments that are the traditionally traditional originally locations of Anglo-American DH sites. We argue that it's precisely the superficial optics that are hidden, whereas the pedagogy and praxis can be found, as I just showed you in some examples, if only we dig a little deeper. Um, so it has not, at least yet, become a term of tactical convenience, as Christian Baum puts it in India. Uh, so what both of these things kind of um, uh, teach us is, um, I'm, I'm trying to see what is the best way to put it. Uh, we do have, you know, uh, P.P. Sneha in a seminal work on mapping digital humanities in India says that the growth of a culture of free and open access to knowledge to some extent has helped facilitate work in the humanities. The lack of access to funding, expertise, and uh, of course, adequate and advanced physical and technological infrastructures such as computational methods often limits the kind of work that can be done with digital artifacts, unquote. Uh, so, uh, as you know, as my colleague, you know, uh, Dipiditi Roy argues that it is uh, worthwhile here to pass out the contextual relevance of the making versus talking, right? So making versus doing, and what is, what does that mean for us in post-colonial spaces? And it seems to us that, you know, uh, that such a binary model and a kind of, you know, uh, even an attempt to essentialize DH in India on any one side of that binary model is really anachronistic since uh, the ability to build or to make often rests on the resources available within an institutional or a cultural or a public space. Uh, so uh, uh, these kind of, you know, DH projects, they not only really involve justifications provided to institutional authorities, uh, it shows that most most of the work that we that we do, the theorizing and the doing, both together, kind of uh, uh, come from a synergy of both of these uh, both of these uh, uh, modes. Because you cannot really kind of you know choose to do one and not the other. And I'll talk in a minute about you know how. Uh, the theorizing part is something we have also kind um, at least I personally am a bit cautious about, and I would like us to take some time uh, before we uh, develop uh, what might be called uh, a robust uh, theoretical vocabulary for DH, uh, uh, DH at least uh, in South Asia, in India, and, and you know, uh, and maybe in other parts of Asia too. Uh, so, uh, so this was again, you know, I'm sorry, I forgot to change the slide, but this is like, you know, data visualization of humanities programs from well-known institutions across the country. Like I said, we went to about 50 uh, public universities, 50 well-known public universities, and um, uh, most of them central universities because we have central universities as well as state universities. And uh, uh, this is, you know, uh, what we found, like, you know, where, what are the intersections where we did find uh, DH in some form or the other. And uh, it's very interesting because one of the places that we, you know, one of the very well developed areas of uh, DH in India is computational linguistics. So you do see, you know, very advanced computational linguistics in many languages, um, as, but especially in Bengali, in, uh, in uh, Malayalam, in Hindi. Um, well, Hindi um, is a bit slower. Um, and surprisingly, you know, Sanskrit too. No, no. 
so uh, you know which brings me to the question of uh, uh, infrastructures and it is always tough to talk about that because i you know what what are the kind of infrastructures that we require? Do we really have an understanding of, you know, uh, the scale of infrastructures that we require uh, here? So here, you know, I'm going to talk about some a very small part of it. I do think that the uh, question of infrastructures is much larger, uh, uh, but I'm going to talk about a very small part of it, which is, you know, publishing and a publishing ecosystem uh, for scholars uh, from India. Uh, and what are the avenues for publishing? What is the state of open access uh, publishing in India? And um, how do we um, uh, how do we navigate that really chaotic space of research publishing, um, open access publishing, predatory um, predatory journals, as well as you know predatory big publishers, uh, and a multilingual research scholarship. So, you know, these are all um, uh, really large questions each and in and of itself. But it was something that, you know, that has always uh, bothered me. And in some ways, you know, my book on remapping the postcolonial canon uh, kind of addresses that question of, you know, what is a postcolonial vocabulary for, you know, for multilingual uh, literature. Right. So um, one of the things that we, uh, so before I go to uh, the open access publishing platform and talk about that uh, as an infrastructural project, I just wanted to say that, you know, that uh, in summary, what are some of the big DH problems that I see in the Indian context? So, um, and these are certainly not comprehensive, but they are some, uh, problems that many of us have faced in many of our uh, individual projects. Uh, one is, you know, certainly a big one for many of us is um, OCR software that is capable of digitizing printed Indic text with high levels of accuracy. So we do have some languages that have better accuracy than others, but even the best of them have only accuracy levels of like 75 or 78 percent, which is uh, which is not uh, which is not enough. Availability of digitized text. So just in terms of basic digitization, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We have not identified those projects and we do not, we have not skilled uh, scholars, students uh, to be able to take on those projects. So, you know, projects of archiving uh, electronic literature, uh, all of that, like, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of work that just needs to know. I can't even begin to talk about it. And I'm happy to kind of, you know, answer, give you some examples and answers, you know, during the Q and A. Uh, uh, like I said, you know, uh, lack of consensus on the disciplinary moniker. So uh, computation based uh, projects and uh, the active involvement of both uh, you know, a technocrat as well as the humanities person. How, how do we, and I know this sounds like it, it would be easier than I make it sound, but it is not, you know, and I, and I say this from experience, because when, when I have done projects with my colleagues in say computer science, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, they also want us to articulate what is their role in the project? What is their active role, right? What is their active role beyond being a service to kind of the problem or the question that we pose? For a project, and and sometimes it's it's uh, it's important to be able to articulate that, and then you know that is when the conceptualization of any project kind of really takes shape, because then you know you you uh, you have a certain uh, understanding, and you know, and you know I make it sound uh, 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 very smooth. It is not because you have real big uh, disagreements and arguments on how you know you might uh, approach a project. Uh, so uh, then the intersectional implications of technology. Uh, you know, the masculinist ideologies of technology itself. So these are questions that we are beginning to address and beginning to negotiate. And uh, I, um, you know, my personal feeling on that is that we need to do that uh, uh, and let 
our understanding of those implications emerge from the projects and from the context of um, uh, the Indian DH spaces. And I think if we do that, uh, we will have a more sustainable and a, uh, and a better uh, theoretical framework and a theoretical vocabulary to understand DH in India. Yeah. Uh -huh. Multilingual pedagogy research and projects, interoperability of infrastructures for archiving repositories. So uh, multilingual pedagogy in terms of simply using different languages to teach is, is present. Uh, but multilingual pedagogy through access to research works, to, uh, through access to you know uh, uh, multilingual research uh, papers or publications uh, is still uh, nascent. Now I want to uh, pause here and say that it is not that they don't exist, especially in the field of literature, in the field of history. In many of these fields, you do have Indian languages that are very rich uh, with their own scholarly conversations and discourses. Right? There's not much interoperability between them. Right? So, um, uh, and, and there is uh, that conversation between those languages still needs some um, some platforms, you know, some kind of, you know, converging platforms where that conversation can take place um, uh, that can lead to, um, to I, I believe, you know, uh, a theoretical uh, vocabulary that would be very useful for us to understand um, Indian DH. And later on, you know, I mean, there's a brilliant article by uh, Charu Singh about, you know, uh, uh, about uh, the Hindi science glossary and uh, uh, and the development of uh, uh, science vocabulary in Hindi and um, well you know and that was way back I think in 1906 and uh, and I wonder why that really did not you know uh, carry forth in the decades later so you do find that it is in uh, in sciences or in engineering where you where it's far more uh, difficult to find research uh, you know research work and publications in different uh, in different languages but uh, uh, you know again we we'll, we can talk about that more uh, so and a bit and a huge need for deliberation on open access you know we all know about coalition s and you know that kind of failed uh, uh, and the ways forward to um, have, you know, to expand uh, avenues of uh, dissemination of research for our research scholars. So right now, you know, the situation is this. Uh, well, let me say, like, you know, um, um, go back a, um, a couple of steps that the situation that we have is that somehow in the last few decades, post-independence, higher education in India, yeah, we miss. I don't know if you know if it is correct to say this, but you know we kind of missed the bus on university presses. So we did not, we do not have a very robust university press um, infrastructure. We did have niche presses in different languages as well as in English that were doing some wonderful you know uh, research publishing, but that uh, you know that huge kind of you know uh, uh, facilitation of uh, publishing through university presses did quite happen in India. So you, what you have is, you know, you have, of course, you know, presses such as the uh, Oxford University Press or Taylor and Francis, and, you know, some Indian uh, presses like uh, uh, Zuban or, uh, you know, Yoda recently, and Okali for Women, Ravi Dayal, um, uh, you have DC Books, you have many of these publishing houses that have been doing a phenomenal job, but that scale that you need for a country like ours um, has been kind of missing. Right? And what that has led us is to this point where now, you know, we have had to withdraw from Coalition S, though we are invested in open access as a uh, open access research publishing, uh, because then where do our, you know, where do our faculty publish? Where are those journals with that, uh, with that high level of uh, rigor and credibility? And you know, what are the steps that we have taken to ensure uh, that, uh, that there is a robust publishing 
research uh, research publishing ecosystem in place and sadly i feel that you know we have not been able to do uh, much we have not really we have kind of failed on that uh, on that account so the question then becomes that if you if that is where we are then how is there a way to correct it is there a way that we can begin to at least build a research ecosystem that takes into account all of these diversities the diversities of language the diversity of disciplines uh, uh, and research areas and the diversity um, you know uh, diversity of you know um, uh, languages different languages so how is there a way that we can uh do that i'm not sure i have an answer in the sense that you know i'm not sure i have an answer to that yes we can do that i just know that yes we need to do that and i think we all need to step up it cannot be done by any single institute or university or by one group of scholars but it has to be a massive effort and that infrastructure for it or uh, that facilitation the national digital library at uh, iit kharagpur is an example of a large project that kind of tries to make open access available to students across the country yeah. and i think you know we need to have that buy in from you know since a lot of public universities in india are funded by Uh, the government of india it really needs to really step up to create that uh, you know create those spaces and repositories and then train students and scholars to be able to uh, uh, you know to be able to uh, build it in 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 different ways so one of the things that we try to do uh, at iit indore and the digital humanities group is to you know in consortium with the uh, in consortium with the ubiquity press that now i think is currently based in california i'm not sure um it used to be in london uh, to create what we call you know iit ship or knowledge sharing in publishing so this is a publishing platform and uh, in in some ways like you know it is uh, it's a very nascent project it needs money and we are kind of right now it's simply a labor of love but um Now, we are trying to model it in some ways not completely but on the stanford university presses you know uh, project uh, my you know digital projects kind of imprint that they have and that kind of fascinated me you know i'm always fascinated in the history of presses and i always enjoy looking at you know what different presses around the world are engaged in and you know i thought that that seemed like a model that maybe as a dh lab we can kind of do that so uh, uh, so we did within that we have like uh, two or three projects that we will be launching through that uh, uh, portal one is you know developing a database for scholarship in indian languages and literatures so this is you know as i said before that uh, it is indian languages uh, and literatures have a very rich scholarship and uh, rich conversations often times they just don't cross their linguistic borders as some of you may know indian states are divided on linguistic lines so often times they don't you know so if you are a scholar in tamil you know you may not know about scholarly work that is being done in marathi which is just you know which is a neighboring state right so uh, um, uh, but you know uh, we also found that the discoverability of many of those research or scholarship is very uh, uh, is not available most of them are still in print you know some of them that are online are not like you know uh, the the archiving and the preservation techniques are not so good so we decided to kind of develop a database for scholarship in indian languages and literatures right now it's a very small database about 2000 entries uh, and in about four different languages and it's it's a simple mla kind of bibliography really you know there's nothing more to it it's just the title uh, the citation um in both the language it is published in and in english and a small abstract and that's it right and we have still not been able to launch it because we need some resources to be able to kind of make it public and you know uh, launch it through the website so we are hoping to be able to uh, do that right so the uh, um, one that i'm really excited about and which should be out in the next few weeks is and this you know um i wanted to what i wanted to share here is how we kind of do dh in our lab 
in uh, at iit indore so this is like you know which is you know um, the uh, co author that you see is my student so uh, uh, this was about 3 3 years ago i think when you know uh, one of my colleagues at presidency university professor shobik mukherjee had an article saying that you know india no country for elit right so you know that article kind of set us thinking that you know uh, is it really no country for elite that we don't have an electronic literature uh, and we found uh, uh, so you know the, as you know the elo has had three volumes of electronic literature and uh, none of the three volumes they do have most of them are uh, american or european uh, with some examples from japan and australia but that's about it it was not a single entry from india Right. so that kind of set us thinking that is it is it possible that you know that if there is electronic literature being produced in different parts of the world and being such a rich literary culture you know for probably a thousand uh, or 2000 years so that nobody is doing electronic literature in india right. so we kind of did a you know we kind of uh, published in dhq and dhs and you know all these different articles where we were simply exploring you know what uh, what is electronic literature like how uh, you know what has be, how has technology influenced literature over the years you know from uh, say early periods then you know how are we locating new literary spaces uh, literary practices in indian digital spaces then we went on to like what could so we found of course that there are electronic literature being produced they are being shared by communities among themselves but there was never there's never been it has never been anthologized so that is why we did not know because there is no kind of volume of indian electronic literature so we kind of came to this article i think which was in dhq or matlab i'm not sure you know the first and second waves of indian electronic literature and so then from there you know what we did was uh, through the uh, publishing portal we uh, set up a call for uh, publishing the first volume of indian electronic literature right and i'm happy to say that it is in the final stages of production we got uh, so this is going to be a truly multilingual volume it is going to be a digital project and it will be in four different languages for now and we hope that you know we will have different uh, another other volumes of it and so you can see like you know that's uh, so that what i said in the beginning about doing thinking making and theorizing kind of you know goes Uh, together and hand in hand for us at the ds lab here in iit indore and i and, and i suspect for many of my colleagues across uh, across the country so this is like you know uh, one of the projects that is just going to be uh, launched from uh, uh, from the publishing portal hopefully in the next next few weeks right so uh, so that's our first kind of successful project through this uh so uh, it has taken us close to 4 years to get to this point with not much help with not without you know getting any big grants uh, um, so now you know we we are now at this point where we have a second call for submissions now before that i want to kind of you know uh, say uh, quote charu singh you know in this this amazing article um uh, science in the vernacular translation terminology and lexicography uh, and when she asked that how was modern science translated into these languages and made available to the publics any analysis of these publics their stratifications and sensibilities demand attention to how science was in practice translated and the whole article is about you know the kind of meticulousness and the uh, nuance with which you know they were struggling to uh, have a language of science for the Uh, for uh, for at the time i think a uh, very large illiterate public but there were people who were really thinking about science pedagogy in indian education and kind of trying to be uh, trying to see how they can get that science um, uh, translated and communicated to this you know uh, to this vast uh public and finding ways of of doing that which the whole exercise itself seemed to be to be so inspiring as well as you know uh, uh fascinating uh, so my, what that shows us is that you know that uh, uh intention that knowledge um is uh, has 
you know, knowledge is closely linked with language and that, you know, it is important that knowledge production as well as knowledge consumption be multilingual and be, you know, available multilingually. Uh, and as she asked, like, you know, what happened, you know, when, uh, why that did not get translated uh, later on? I think that's a very um, a difficult question to answer and would take, you know, perhaps a lecture by itself. But uh, it is true that, you know, that uh, that has not uh, happened in the way we would like it to happen. And which is why, and I think, which is why we are in the space where, uh, uh, where we are kind of, you know, um, lost or lacking of a publishing ecosystem. And, our, and you know, recently I saw an article or a recent survey that said that uh, uh, India produces the fourth largest number of PhDs in the world. Right. Uh, so I think at the in the US it's about sixty four thousand, and in India it's about twenty four or twenty eight thousand uh, PhDs a year. You no, know, I would think that you know for a country of size that's perhaps still uh, a little less. However, given that it is still so you know so high, uh, and if the avenue for publishing for those twenty eight thousand scholars every year is only the global publishing network, right? The global, you know, without having any kind of, you know, part in creating some of those global uh, publishing uh, within uh, within the country and creating an infrastructure for them, I think, you know, we are uh, we are not we are not serving them well in terms of their both their access as well as their understanding to you know to push the limits of knowledge so i think you know to think about publishing as a deep infrastructural problem is the need of the day and i think that you know um, we have conversations where we have the science technology and innovation policy that seems to kind of talk about it but i have not yet seen any concrete uh, uh, you know any concrete uh, what you call you know uh, steps towards it i would certainly like to see uh, like to see more right. so um, the struggles of you know chip or knowledge sharing in publishing as a pilot project as well as its enormous challenges both in technology and epistemology underlines the challenges that similar projects across universities should address as dh projects this in turn means a certain institutional recognition of the intellectual labor and practice that go into creating and making these projects such that we can make through pedagogy and curriculum dh practitioners of the next generation who will have at the very least a theoretical and technological toolkit of ideas and tools that are contextualized for the challenges in and around their locations and i think you know uh, we need um, what I call a reconceptualization of the design of the indexes of the web of the internet and reimagine the possibilities of platform democracy, uh, democracy and ownership of archival material, data and metadata, and in some way rethink the meaning of the word location and sites for digital curation and dissemination. Because I do think that as much as we like to think that the digital is global, it is not global as many of us know. Right? So when data is you know, uh, located in different spaces, and I will uh, point out here, you know, really you know, the partition archive that is with Stanford University, uh, that you know, uh, when I try to access that, you know, the 1947 partition archive, uh, I find that you know I do not have access to all the testimonials. I do not have access to those stories, right? Which means that you know I'm sure a person in 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 Punjab, you know, who uh, who has not contributed to that testimonial, uh, because I think if you have, then you do get access. Uh, but wants to know about a partition story cannot really access that story, right? The partition museum in uh, you know in Amritsar that has come up recently, I think you know also is a uh, is a locational monument of the partition. But I think you also need a kind of a digital monument, and you need to have access to those uh, resources. Because to me, a part of me, you know, in my post-colonial training, I think about. Uh, you know, when one of my students was doing a, 
project on the thugs of the 18th century my uh, we realized that we needed a charles wallace fellowship which luckily she did get uh, to travel to london because a lot of the documents were in uh, in the british Mu uh, british council right and we had to go there to access it and then you know kind of work on those on those documents so this is from the 19th century uh, has uh, have we changed that you know have we changed that in terms of ownership of data should we not if we have not should we not think carefully about those uh, you know about those issues so uh, uh, these are the questions that often you know uh, come to my mind uh, what many of these you know uh, yeah i think i left a sentence halfway but uh, students you know who are trained in theoretical and technological toolkit of ideas and digital infrastructures have to be part of the making and imagining of dh in india and we cannot afford to do either in isolation it would have to interact and be messy and there will be more than a few uh, failures and we need to recognize and learn from those failures um, but an ecosystem will emerge that will foster far more creative projects in the future and to me that is also a part of developing infrastructure that not being fixated on only the success stories you know again i borrow from my colleagues in the sciences where you know they do have what is what are called you know protocols protocol papers protocol publications so protocol publications in some ways tries to document you know uh, uh, protocols for a particular experiment uh, what you should do and sometimes also publishes articles of what you should not do right i think you know we have been talking i have i've recently taken uh, you know been included as a, as a general editor in dhq but we have kind of talking about how to do that uh, within uh, within dh which i think is really uh, really important uh, what the above examples demonstrate is that the diversity of disciplines projects and motivations constituting uh, what we argue is the digital humanities landscape in india makes it organically transdisciplinary promising the quote the methodological and social diversity unquote found wanting in anglo american dh as alan lu has pointed out in 2018 uh, so uh, you know i've only pointed out a few examples from the numerous projects spanning history economics literature especially translation studies by the way artificial intelligence and nlp based projects and so on uh, if digital humanities as an umbrella term is to have a role in india it must be one of documenting harnessing and facilitating these kinds of works and projects as well as empowering their access to resources both capital and academic to ensure that engagement with the digital is rewarding and incentivized within academia at large the labor and intellectual rigor involved in developing these archives and repositories has to be recognized as legitimate research output and not merely as appendages or ancillaries to real humanistic thinking and i know that sounds archaic but trust me you know it still exists so making involves theorizing and doing and these components are inseparable if we are to understand the complex networks of the digital the analog and the human uh, and finally before i end and i'll you know uh, i'll elaborate on any part of this as any of you may want me to but in his uh, essay you know i talked about theorizing and in you know, articulating a theory in his essay the computational turn thinking about the digital humanities david berry points out that computational technology has become the very condition and possibility required in order to think about the many of the questions raised in the humanities today unquote so berry quotes host childers differentiation between intellect uh, intellect and intelligence and calls for a digital intellect as opposed to a digital intelligence and that kind of you know uh, underlines a very important shift from computational humanities to you know to digital humanities right and we know that other scholars like such as kathleen fitzpatrick and others have also pointed and extended that argument about you know critical humanities a critical dh and conceptual dh and cognitive dh and so on right so what i argue what we argue is that the ontological exploration of dh paradigms in india has only begun what these case studies demonstrate is that in the process of building and tooling each of these projects will develop an individual intellect that emerges from an intelligent task at hand rather than rush to work in borrowed metaphors 
borrowed theoretical metaphors that may or may not work for the larger body of digital humanities work across the post-colonial space that is India, or even to rush to pitch tents or markers which supporting ontology, digital pedagogy, and training in India, we should simply let diverse projects develop their narrative intellects. And these narrative intellects will, in time, give us a theoretical and conceptual vocabulary that is organic and will invest the pedagogy in the coming decade with much needed clarity and connection. Uh, so uh, digital humanities in India is a journey, a data point that is part of a cosmic but networked chaos. Um, I keep going back to that word. Uh, as scholars who work in the intersectional identities and humanities, those data points are marked with a lot of support Entering, learning, and learning. Um, and as I said, that you know, when we surveyed university courses across various small and big universities, that you know, many of them are recognizing the need to introduce digital humanities courses. Uh, and it demonstrates that the ubiquity of computational resources and techniques as an essential part of humanities inquiry is increasingly recognized across liberal arts departments. But the willingness, resources, and institutional support to translate these into pedagogical tools and curriculum is still nascent and emerging. Uh, as founders of, you know, as co-founders of Dharti or the Digital Humanities Association of India, we are excited to see the diversity of work being carried out in the discipline by our members. We have very developed and advanced research in computational linguistics, you know, computer science working on Unicode and, you know, working on index scripts, AI in perception and con uh, uh, cognitive computing, gaming theory. We now have a whole uh, group of elit electronic literature in India. So it's a group of young scholars, which is really exciting to see. Uh, so we envisage DH in India as a big tent research area that fosters a conversation between all of these varying and disparate interests. Uh, DH in India is in the making, in the mapping, the doing, the theory rising and many more and unlike dh in europe north america dh in india is functioning at the intersection digital and the analog because the major structural forces already exclude so i'll kind of stop there and uh, uh, take questions i have rushed through a lot of things i realized that but uh, I'm happy to you know, you know, expand on any part that you may want. Thank you.